Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody joining us from across the globe. Uh, this is no summary conversations with artists that don't fit in a box. We are Golden Thread Productions. For those who may not know, Golden Thread is the first uh, American theater company focused on the Middle East, and we are based in San Francisco. Uh, it's my pleasure today to join uh, four fabulous playwrights of Arab heritage who we just had the honor of commissioning to create new work. They are Hassan Abdul Razak, Hannah Khalil, joining us from the UK, Tariq Hamami, and Mona Mansour, joining us from the US in New York. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Hera. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to start by asking you uh, identity questions. Oh dear. Um, so I'm curious to hear from you how ben. your... Uh, What's it with Ben? Aha, background noise. Uh, how your Middle Eastern or uh, Arab heritage has influenced uh, your writing, your, uh, your work. Whoever wants to start first. Um, I guess I... Uh, I can dive in. Um, so my name is Tarek Hamami. Um, my uh, background is I'm Algerian American. And uh, I guess the way that my background has influenced my my work I, is because I always kind of feel like I'm, you know, in, uh, in two worlds, you know, um, that of being in America and that of my of where I was born and where I come from in Algeria. And so, um, and also trying to hold on to that identity because I feel like, especially uh, from, from non-Arab people, they'll say, oh, you don't look Arab. And so they won't know that I am. And so I've always felt this need to let people know to really hold on to that. And so I think a lot of my writing has been influenced by that of people trying to hold on to who they are, figure out who they are, or, or, or define who they are as a person as well. And also the fact that um, my, I, I, was, I was raised in a dual religious house, uh, my dad being Muslim and my mom being Catholic. Uh, I think I've always, my writing is always focused around faith in some way and not specific religion, but just that idea of faith and how do you find, um, faith meaningful specific to you when there's so many different ideas around and so I think that's kind of influenced my writing as I've as I've grown as a writer. Thanks. Um, Hannah you want to go next? Sure. Um, so I am, am half Palestinian, half Irish, and uh, I was brought up in the Middle East as a child in Dubai and then my parents separated when I was a teenager. And I came to London and I was with my Irish mum and I still saw my dad frequently, but I, I didn't go to Palestine after I was 11. And, um, and I was sort of, I didn't feel part of uh, a sort of Arab community or uh, a diaspora. And then in my early 20s, I started writing plays and I always wrote Arab characters because I felt so frustrated with the way um, Arab characters were portrayed often on telly and um, in the theatre and so I was trying to redress that balance but I was also sort of trying to to uh, learn more about my own heritage and and through that kind of process of beginning to write plays about my heritage I reconnected with it in this really beautiful way and and I met and and sort of became part of this wonderful uh, growing uh, diaspora of Arab artists in London and more widely the UK and and so yeah uh, the, the first play I wrote about Palestine Plan D was really sort of important to me because it was terrifying I was really scared to write about such a huge subject but then it felt really like the right thing to do and now I don't seem to I don't seem to be able to write about anything else <laughs> um, which is you know, problematic because the Irish side are getting annoyed. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's that's me. Uh, Mona? Uh, hi, everybody. Nice to see you all. I'm the only one wearing these monstrosities. Um, I would just echo what Tarek and 
Hannah have said, uh, that feeling of being like half, you know, I mean, I'm born and raised in America, but my dad came from Lebanon in the late 50s. And um, where I grew up in Southern California, my dad was sort of the first person from his, his village to uh, come to the States. And so when the war happened, uh, many of our cousins uh, came to live with us. And so I always say it was like the Middle East kind of came to our house. So um, it is interesting. And to hear you talk about that, Hannah, about <clears throat> kind of when you started to write into that, whatever that is, that identity, because I don't, yeah, I, I don't think I had a palpable sense of it until I started to write my own material. Like I was an actor before, um, but when I look back, like the first complete thing that I wrote that wasn't a sketch, that wasn't like sketch comedy, was a play called Me in the SLA. And it was about my obsession with Patricia Hearst, uh, who I don't know if anybody was, but you know, um, who was kidnapped and blah, blah, blah. Um, but it was like the SLA, which also was the Southern Lebanese army. And, and so I brought into this whole sort of notion of like, you know, how, at the end of the day, it was my desire to be really American and not just American, but to be like one of the gold chip families of America. Like I, I didn't wanna be middle-class and I didn't wanna be, certainly didn't wanna be like Arab middle-class. Um, and, and I guess the last thing I'll say right now is that <clears throat> I moved to New York a year after 9-11. And at that time there was so much going on there was a community that was beginning to coalesce. So there was a company called Nick Nebras. And, you know, out of that, I think Noor came and, and the Lark started to have things go on. And that's really been a joy uh, to see that grow. And part of the reason it grows is because stuff's happening, like bad things are happening. But the flip side is we get to be in conversation and to talk about things that we probably didn't talk about before. Thanks, Mona. Hassan? Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Hassan Abdirazak. I'm, I'm a playwright originally from Iraq. And I, I grew up in uh, a little bit in Iraq uh, uh, until the age of eight. And I left uh, and moved around in, uh, in Egypt, in Algeria as well, and, in, uh, and in, uh, to, to the United Kingdom. And I wasn't, when I arrived in the United Kingdom, I had this sort of Arab makeup in my in my in my blood, and I had family connections. But I start, wanted to really integrate. I wanted to become sort of part of the British society, and I didn't really think. I, I avoided thinking about the politics of the Middle East and so on. I, this was something like my dad and his generation did, and and I wanted to be kind of different from that. But circumstances forced forced the identity in a way upon me. The first was the first Gulf War. And suddenly I was at university and everybody around me, the student union were talking about Saddam Hussein and Iraq and as if everybody was an expert. And it felt really, really frustrating when I was watching my country uh, sort of uh, suffering in that, in that first Gulf War. And people, like my frustration of the people's lack of basic understanding that Iraq was not, uh, was not at all about Saddam Hussein. And that was really implanted the first sort of impulse to try and make create stories that explain who I am and what my people are like and what I know about Iraqis. Um, but really probably what cemented it for me was I went to the States in 2011 and I worked in Boston and just when 9-11 happened. Uh, and I had a group of Arab uh, friends. I was, I was working as a scientist. My background is not, is not really literature, it's more science and my academic background. Um, and, um, and there we really became kind of a very closely together. And we started talking about politics all the time and about Arab identity. And it was the first time I read Edward Said and it, it politicized me, obviously, 9-11. And it was, it was very difficult to be in America at that time. I had in my neighborhood trucks driving by going uh, with a slogan, death to all Muslims now. And I will never forget that. It's kind of it's emblazoned on my on my memory. So when I went back to the to England, I was I, I had this desire to write. And I went and I saw plays about Iraq. And I knew I knew the Iraq war was going to happen even before it happened. And then I saw these plays about Iraq. 
uh, written by uh, English playwrights and American playwrights, and it really frustrated me. And that was my incentive to write my first play, which was uh, Baghdad Wedding, uh, and to try and give voice to uh, to 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 the truth about Arabs as I knew as I knew it. Thanks, Hassan. It's it's interesting because um, I come from Iran and I come also from a Muslim Christian background, and I had to move to the U.S. because of the Iranian Revolution or stay in the U.S. because of the revolution in Iran in 1979, and I feel like our lives are so impacted by politics that the um, I don't know the ambivalence that we encounter in the US and I don't know if it's the same in the UK or not. The ambivalence towards politics really bothered me. I remember during the hostage crisis, Iran was on the news every night. You know, the, the reports of the hostages were uh, every like day one, day 30, day whatever. Um, but People in my neighborhood, I think there was only one family in my neighborhood who actually knew where Iran was. Nobody knew where the country was, what language people speak or what the revolution is about or what is going on, or what the US has done there. So there is this urge, I feel that we all share to tell our stories and I wonder um, Hannah, you talked about, you know, your Irish side is now gonna, uh, you know, want to be represented. And Mona, I know in your trilogy, you have kind of mapped out your family history, both your mother's side and your dad's side, right? Um, and I wonder, yeah, what is, what is that urge to like do justice to the complexity complexity and the many layers that we that we carry because I feel like I'm constantly in a position of correcting people we are not just this we're not just that especially you know as a woman from the Middle East and I wonder if uh, any of you have uh, or Hannah and Mona just because I mentioned your plays if you have uh, something to add sure um, I, I, I very much like echo everything that you said Taranj and it's really for me a lot of it's about there's a there's a fine line because you don't want to write history lessons that's not our job as as artists we we it's not our job to educate people in a sort of you know in an academic kind of way and sometimes people see my plays and they're like but I didn't find out enough about the history and I'm like there's this thing called google feel free you know like you can find out if you really want to find out it's more a provocation but also about demystifying and sort of it's that I'm sure we've all felt like we don't I, I want to see the people that I know on stage the Arabs I know like and we're talking about sort of also about I think it's important to talk about Islam and about Muslims and and you know I talk about this so much to, to people who are Christian because like many of you I'm also you know I have Catholicism on one side and I have Islam on the other side and in any portrayals of Christianity people are allowed to have different degrees of um, commitment to their faith aren't they you know you can be a Christian who's a very very dedicated Christian and who goes to, to church every Sunday or you can be someone who just prays occasionally but that's not allowed if you're a Muslim and you're not allowed to have an ongoing negotiation or conversation with your faith if you're a Muslim and so I think I think just showing people those possibilities because everything's always so binary is really, really important. And that's, and I feel like the responsibility is more to about humanizing and saying, look, we're all the same, really, aren't we? You know, we're all just human beings and, and with different experiences, have a look, have a look, open the door, look in the door and see, this is the house. This is the, this is, these are the conversations we have. It's not so different. And uh, as a way of kind of, opening the door for people to then take responsibility to go and find out more and as you say to us like to, to find out what's going on in these places that you have an opinion about but you don't really know anything about yeah i uh hearing you say iraq hassan is like i don't say music to my ears but i've heard people 
talk about Iraq. And I'm like, uh, if you don't know how to fucking pronounce it, then don't talk to me about what we should be doing over there. Um, just to clarify, like my, so the trilogy is about, you know, a fictitious Palestinian scholar and kind of these two ways his life could go. So just to be super clear, you know, my dad's Lebanese and while almost an atheist, you know, is, is from, is Christian. And so I didn't know I would be writing that trilogy. I mean, it was a completely unwise decision, right? Like so many things we do in the arts, like you're just like, wait, how did I, but I had written the first play, Urge for Going, um, which is now the third play in the trilogy. But I really wrote that just to sort of say, I, I wanted to sort of interrogate the place my father came from and specifically his village, which is called Miyumiye and it's in the South and it's near Sidon. And when you tell people that your family's from Miyumiye, they go, oh, we were at the camp. Like they assume they're from the camp. They actually don't realize that there's like a village there. And so when I was growing up, it was, you know, I would say the notion of Palestine was, was in my home um, and not in an academic way and not in a particularly um, a way that I would appreciate now, but it, it sort of made me want to look at that. So um, I just wanted to clarify that, but it, the interesting thing I think, at least doing this in the States is that our community, right? So like in the trilogy itself, I, I have two actors who are Palestinian. I also have an Iranian actress and I have someone who is, I think Nadine Malouf is like Italian and Lebanese and Caitlin Cassidy is like Syrian and Irish. There's a lot of us who are just these mixes of things. And, and so we sort of, I, what am I trying to say? I think we sort of bring that, that, that confrontation that we've had with both sides, we sort of bring it into the room, um, if that makes sense. And it, and it creates a sort of energy um, that you, you might not have, right? If you did it in, in the country where it was, where it was set. Um, but that thing about wanting to correct people, and I, I totally echo what you're saying, Taraj, and Hannah, that thing too of like, I've had people say the same thing. Like, well, wait a minute, I, I wanted to know more. And it's this, yeah we're, it's a play. And moreover, you know, it's not an NGO. Like if it, if it does uh, open up hearts and minds, I mean, I, I don't know why we would be doing this if we didn't want to do that, but to say, well, I hope to get 200 more signatures or something that's an actionable item. I'm not writing those. I mean, people can, but that's not where I'm at. Um, I sort of want to unsettle people too, just like any theatrical experience. Speaking of where we're at, um, oh, Tarek, did you want to add something? Well, I was just going <laughs> to add in there. I think part of the thing that draws us to tell like our stories is also this, I feel like there's no greater, uh, or just there's nothing more sad than when people aren't known you know, like, for instance, when I was growing up and people would ask, oh, that's an interesting name. Where are you from? I would say I'm from Algeria. And at first they'd say, oh, Nigeria. I said, no, 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 Algeria. And they wouldn't, they would get, never heard I of get, it. I get, I get, I say Palestine. They say, oh, Pakistan. And I'm yeah. like, no. <laughs> yeah, no, two different places. And then they'll say, oh, I'd never heard of that country before. And it's, it's the largest country in Africa, you know, so, um, so this idea of of not even knowing that our like our people exist, and then even on top of that, the, the struggles that are faced. Like uh, I wrote a play about the Algerian civil war, and part of the reason I wrote it is because no one knew it happened, and so all of these people suffered, all these people died, and especially in the United States, if you would mention Algerian civil war, people would say, "Oh, I didn't even know that happened there." So. I think there's a lot of, of North African and Middle Eastern hit like not, uh, not even history because you know like you said we don't want to write a history lesson but just knowing that there are that, that there's struggle and that there's triumph and that there's people there not just from what you see on your 90 second clip on the news every night um, I think that's a driving force. 
you're all, um, you, you know, you have established careers as playwrights. Uh, some of you also teach. So I'm curious, what did you have lined up uh, before the pandemic hit? And I guess that's the first part of the question. And then the second part is, and what did you, how did that, how did the pandemic change and what did you end up working on? <clears throat> I, Maybe well, we'll I, let Hassan start. Oh yeah. I was, um, I was asked to write, which, which I would still love to do. Uh, but although the, the centenary has passed, but there was the centenary of the Iraq 1920 revolution, which was an uprising that happened in Iraq. It, it started uh, mainly in the south of Iraq against the British uh, colonial powers. Um, and, uh, and I was being asked uh, to, to do that as a, as a project uh, for uh, the Bradford uh, Literary Festival. Uh, and then of course COVID happened and, and it, did, it didn't happen, but it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, I'm still reading about that revolution and I would, maybe it's something I would, I would sort of come back to it because there are, in Iraq history, there's always these echoes of everything that happened under the British have, has also subsequently happened under the Americans and these echoes and connections, which Hannah brilliantly explored in her play, um, uh, 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 Museum, sorry, I was, it's was gone out of my head, uh, the title, <laughs> but you, you will say it. Um, um, so uh, yeah, um, you know, that, those connections between the past and the present are, are something of interest to me. So I hope to go back to that project once, once COVID goes. Tarek, do you want to jump in? I, yeah, I was actually right in the middle of a, of a rehearsal uh, process for a production um, at the school that I teach at, uh, me and a, a two colleagues of mine. We, uh, we wrote a musical about the life, uh, another actual historical story about someone named Mary Rogers who, who was lived in New York and died under mysterious circumstances and it was interesting because it became the first tabloid you know kind of murder story where people sensationalize things and so it was this idea of like the news starting to not become the news anymore and then subsequently people had you know written about used her death as a means to write something else and no one's ever actually written about her and her life um, so we wrote a musical about her and we were in the middle of rehearsal when suddenly everything shut down and so the whole production kind of got canceled and uh, and so now uh, we're back in this semester doing it but now it'll be in a radio play with a uh, with kind of a video companion piece to it so it's it's been a whole uh, new world of, of theater production um, trying to do a musical over zoom I can tell you is is a little difficult. <laughs> and so we're, been, we're trying to find our way through that right now. Hannah, you wanna tell us what you were doing and what are you doing now? Sure, so um, it was, April was supposed to be my month, April 2020, little did I know. Um, I had had my play museum in Baghdad that um, Hassan so kindly. I mean, you can imagine how terrified I was when I sent the first draft of that play to my good friend, the Iraqi playwright Hassan Abdul Razak. I've written a play about the museum in Baghdad. Please don't, please don't tell me off. Please don't hate it. Thank goodness. He only had one note, which was, we don't drink mint tea, we drink cardamom tea. I was like, I'll take that. That's fine. <laughs> um, anyway, so, um, so I, that play had been at the Royal Shakespeare Company in Stratford-upon-Avon, and it was supposed to be transferring to London, to the Kiln Theatre, which was used to be called the Tricycle. So that was hugely exciting. And at the same time, I was supposed to have a play opening at Hampstead Theatre, which is just up the road. And I absolutely adored the idea that people who had never heard of me, which is most people in North London would be like, who's this bitch who's got a play on at two theatres? Like we've never heard of her. And she's got a play on like, like one stop on the tube away from each other. But sadly it wasn't to be. So the, the show that was supposed to be on at Hampstead was a play called Sleepwalking, which is a two-hander about motherhood. And both shows have been canceled and I don't know what's going to happen with them. So that was very sad and I was very, um, I was very low in April um, as what I was calling the ghost milestones went past. Tonight should be first night. Tonight should be closing night. But um, 
I've had some lovely other opportunities. I've always wanted to write for children. I've got a daughter who's eight and um, who's really annoyed that she's never allowed to watch any of my plays because they're not really appropriate. And uh, so I've, I've been working on a couple of things for young people. One was a joyous, I mean, what I've been so impressed by is how innovative people have been. And so one project was a, a company called Fly High Stories who are a young people's company here, basically commissioned a bunch of writers to write tiny plays, five minute plays that were to be sort of uh, reimaginings of classic stories. And the idea was, that you could download them, print them at home, and then perform them at home with your kids, so during lockdown. And so I wrote one for them called Not the Gingerbread Man, which is basically about the fact that we couldn't get any flour. I don't know if you had the same thing in the States, but everyone bought up all the flour and all the thing, everyone was baking. And so my version is, we can't make a gingerbread man because there's no flour in the house. So let's make Rocky Road instead, and it became the Rocky Road person, and because we made a lot of that. Um, yeah, so I've been doing that. And I also have been doing some adaptations of Greek myths, which has been really lovely and I'm really enjoying that. So yeah, I've, I've been keeping busy. Jump in, Mona. Um, I, wait, did you make Rocky Road ice cream or is it like an English? So what is Rocky Road? Okay, so Rocky Road is like a- I should know, but- I'll send you the recipe. So basically what it is, is okay. it's, like a, it's like a mix up of biscuits with marshmallows and nuts and raisins and chocolate. And you sort of mush it all together and melt it together. And then you stick it in the fridge and you cut it into blocks. It's delicious. Okay, I'll yeah, send you a recipe. Me. Yeah. Um, I, I think we're all gonna need that recipe. I know. Let's just put it on a group chat. Um, I is similar, you know. I mean, to everybody's experiences. I was at the public theater. We were in our third technical rehearsal for the Vagrant trilogy. Um, you know, in terms of working on it, like with the public, it's it's been about a ten year process. So, I I almost feel like I. I haven't blacked it out, but it's just like, I don't, I think I just went on autopilot. You know, we were all called into the Ansbacher space at the theater. Um, there were three plays rehearsing um, at that time. The Visitor was another one and nobody knew anything. And at that point, I thought I would be coming up back over the weekend for a paper tech. I was like, I'll do it. Um, and here we are. Uh, my beloved director, Mark Wing Davey got, got COVID, he's better, thank God, but it was very, obviously, you know, scary time. And in New York uh, in particular, um, that from what I know is, is postponed and, you know, our set is in there. We've got this like 2000 pound, the main piece of our set that at different times was a hill in Palestine and then a sort of ceiling in London and then the floor of their dwelling and urge for going. So it's in there. Um, the cast somewhere in there, because we were sort of broken up so quickly, we started doing these Friday night Zooms and we kind of had a good record and we get together. Sometimes there's music, um, there's poetry. Sometimes it's just bitching and complaining about life, but we, we always read this Naomi Shihab Nye poem called Kindness that I highly recommend. We just read, it's like going to church and we always read that. Um, but- You need to share that with us. Yeah, I will. It's anyway, it's gorgeous to be able to connect with all of them and we miss each other terribly. And, um, you know, in theater, there's so much, I, I assume it's the same in the UK, but I know in the States, there's a sense of, you know, I don't know, people can be expendable or like, look, you know, just, and, and, and I, I try to fight back against that. Also in regard to casting, it's like, no, this person's been with this piece for nine years. I have a couple of the actors who've been with it since the beginning. And so it's, it's terrible. Like, I'm not going to lie. It's really painful. Um, but I'm grateful for that. So that is postponed. And beyond that, I had I was supposed to have two productions of We Swim, We Talk, We Go to War uh, next year. Um, one that's been canceled and the other, I just haven't heard anything at all. I, I have a suspicion that that's not happening. Um, so that's, you know, 
I have a theater company and, and, and we did do a play on Zoom um, back in August, I think. And I was very, very happy about how that turned out. Uh, it was a play, we, we, we researched it the way, you know, the joint stock method um, and we wrote it and it's an absurd and ridiculous, and very heightened. And it somehow my director, Scott Ellingworth did an incredible job. And that play is called Beginning Days of True Jubilation. And we do wanna do it in person sometime next year, but, um, but that was a gift and it, and it helped to laugh because you know, at one point I was like, should we be doing this now? There's so much in the world that it just seems like, is it out of tune? But I think at least speaking for myself, it was a gift to sit in a rehearsal and be like, how, how is this ridiculous bit gonna work? How are we gonna do this little shtick, right? This comedia moment. Um, it's a gift. I think the psychic cost to all of us, we just don't even know. Um, not to sound, because there's so many things in the world that are so literally more important, right? Than, than, than like my expression as a playwright. But at the same time, it's, it's part of all that. And I, I do think that, I don't know, I follow Hannah on Twitter. So we get to sort of check in and on each other that way. And um, you're pretty open about the stuff you go through. And it's, there's, you know, I think there's a lot of, a lot of us in theater who are, who are becoming adaptable, which is great, but we are grieving. And it's, it's the thing that we wanna do the most and the reason we're in this ridiculous business has been sort of, you know, uh, taken away from us. Um, and I just wanna say one last thing, which is it didn't have to be that way. And it definitely did not have to be that way in the United States. Thanks, Mona. Uh, we have some questions from the folks that are watching on Facebook, and I think we'll shift our conversation to talk about your commissioned work. Uh, so Golden Thread has commissioned you to create new work, and that's been, uh, it's, it's one way that Golden Thread, uh, obviously we try to support our artists during this tough time that there have been so many cancellations, but also as, you, you all mentioned, um, I think we're all looking for community. We're all looking for opportunities to be creative and to find uh, creative fulfillment. So I think <clears throat> giving an excuse to playwrights to, to sit down and write via a commission, I think has been one way uh, for us at Golden Thread to do that. And I wanna begin with you, Tarek. Uh, so your commission is uh, to write a play about the Black Panther's time in Algeria. Um, I know that this is early in the process, but is there something you can share with us about that? Yeah, it's, um, it's a really fascinating thing to, to dive into research-wise because there's, there's some things I, I, I kind of knew about, some things I, I you know, knew a little bit of information about, but the more you dive into it, it's it's a really fascinating time in Algeria and specifically in Algiers in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, because basically the, the general idea is um, uh, Eld Eldridge Cleaver had to flee the United States and him and, and some other prominent Black Panthers found their way to Algiers. And the reason why they went there is because the uh, Algerian revolution had had just ended earlier in the decade and Algeria and specifically Algiers had kind of established itself as this hub for anti-colonial revolutionaries around the world and so it wasn't just the Black Panthers but there are many other groups that were all kind of converging onto the city all at the same time and it's just this fascinating look at how um, you know the new Algerian government wanted to establish you know, a, a governance for its people, but also be uh, like a kind of beacon for other uh, countries around the world to, to kind of exile their, their colonial oppressors. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited about this play too, because 
Uh, I mean, one, it combines a story from both of my, my heritages, you know, the Algeria and America. And part of the reason why everybody was coming to Algiers at the time was because of the Algerian revolution. And as I started researching this, I realized that a lot of my, my conversations with family growing up had focused largely on, on the Algerian civil war because that had been you know, so prevalent through my life that I realized I had never really spoken to my dad or my, a lot of my relatives about the revolution. You know, like my dad was a child during the revolution. And so I sat down finally and just said, tell me about the revolution. What do you remember what happened? And he told me these amazing stories that I realized, how have I never heard this before? Um, and so I, you know, uh, it's been fascinating to go down that line. And so I think the story will have a lot to do with, with the revolution and mainly the, the aftermath of the revolution. And, um, and then what the Black Panthers were looking to, to get from being in Algiers, whether it be information or even resources, um, because the Algerian government at the time would at some point officially recognize a revolution and give them like office space and a monthly stipend. So you're also getting resources from it. And so I, I think the play will focus mainly on um, the, the Black Panthers looking for that official recognition from the Algerian government and then finding the similarities between the Algerian revolution and the revolution that the Black Panthers are trying to start here in the United States. Because the more, the more you, you go into it, the more you realize that there were many um, similarities in terms of the treatment uh, from the uh, each person's oppressor and um, and then ultimately what they what they were looking to do and also what some of the you know the the roadblocks or the you know the the pitfalls were because you know all, as Algerians we definitely had a lot of pitfalls after the after the revolution there and I think that there were um, I think some things that the uh, that the Black Panthers might have learned from that maybe so that's that's why I, I've been really excited about it, just for the research and also a, an excuse to pester all my my relatives and the the people I know for stories and and even my dad's um, old friends from college, you know, because um, it turns out that uh, Eldridge Cleaver announces to the world in July of 1969 at the University of Algiers that he's now in Algeria, and I did the math and I realized, wait, my dad began his undergraduate studies at the University of Algeria the next month. And so um, he, uh, him and, and some of his good friends from college um, were, were kind of in the midst of, of everything uh, during that. And so they've been some really good, um, a, lot of, a lot of good help and, and stories have been coming from that. That's great. That sounds fascinating. And then the three of you, Hannah, Mona, and Hassan, you guys decided to collaborate on one play. And I just want to be clear that this isn't something Golden Thread asked or suggested, but that the three of you uh, suggested and are pursuing. So who wants to speak on behalf of your mutual project? Go on, Hassan. All right. Uh, well, we, uh, we are still very early days. So we've actually uh, had our first meeting today uh, just discussing broad ideas. Um, and Mona had the idea of having this uh, sheet of uh, Google sheet that we are sharing and putting in kind of like a collage of ideas. So everybody's just putting in things that are attracting them. Um, you know, stories that they've come across or specific moments and just kind of, we're building it up into layers now and um, uh, to, so what our, our subsequent meeting will be building up on these ideas and trying to find where the connections are. Um, and then Hannah had today uh, this wonderful idea of just like kind of having almost like a baton being passed on. So maybe one of us would start with, with uh, with writing something and then somebody else would react to it and uh, take uh, maybe a character or a, or a moment uh, and expand them uh, or take something into, into, their, into the next story. And so we would write three stories that have a kind of 
uh, either it's going to be a thematic link or just a, a basic link, uh, but we're not, we're not wedded that it has to be completely synchronized. Um, I think we can, we can each bring our own kind of um, uh, interest to it. And, and what I've is, had, what, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And I've had, uh, so I'm, so far, this is very early. I mean, I'm sharing something that will probably change completely by the time we get through the process. <laughs> but I'm, I was interested in two areas of, one was an, an incident that sort of happened to me uh, where I visited a, uh, I, was, I was visiting a town called Dorset in, in the south of, of, of England. And I met a group of, of people who I thought would be sort of very liberal, very left-wing. And I was quite shocked by their anti-immigrant uh, stance. And this was post-Brexit. Um, um, and, uh, and Dorset is not one of those places that is uh, typically talked about when people talk about Brexit. They talk about uh, working class northern towns where people have, didn't have jobs and so on. Dorset is actually quite wealthy. And, and a lot of people who live there uh, have, have money. So uh, I'm interested in, in, in that, in that dynamic of, of people who have. And then on a completely different subject, I don't know which one I'm going to pursue. I'm also interested in people who um, come back from the dead, uh, people who are who experience near death exp or have death experiences and are resuscitated and being brought back. And now there is a whole science uh, to that, uh, that where uh, people are. Um, uh, can be brought back and, uh, and there are machines that are being made and and so on that that uh, uh, allows you know so, so the moment when you die is not really a final moment it's a moment where you can be brought back from and there's something about that a metaphor somewhere is sitting in that in the idea that I might explore so maybe it's somebody who uh, has a near-death experience in Dorset <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> combining both <laughs> ideas yes and does uh, Hannah, Mona, do you guys want, we have one more question from our Facebook audience, but um, I want to give Hannah and Mona a chance if you have something about this collaboration that you want to comment on or uh, idea that you want to share. I'll just say that, like, I mean, all my ideas are very in their infancy, but what an amazing opportunity you've given us, Taranj, you know, like, seriously, as, as writers, you never, ever get a message from someone saying, we'd like to commission you. Do you want to have a think about what you might like to? I mean, it just never happens. You have to go <laughs> begging, begging, begging and like dance and buy wine and be charming. And so and, and to have the opportunity to write with these two other writers who are so brilliant, whose work I respect so much and who I love. And, you know, writing is such an isolated thing. So to be able to kind of have a, particularly now as well, you know, we don't even leave the house for meetings anymore. So to, to be able to have conversations and to share creative ideas with these two, it's just, I hope you know, Taranj, how grateful we are and how, how exciting it is for all of us. It's, it's really wonderful. Thank goodness for Golden Thread. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. So Mona, our next question from the audience, I think is directed at you because you began working as an actor and then uh, sort of started writing. And the question is, can you share a time you really resonated with or saw yourself in a character or play on stage, a formative moment that brought you to writing the plays you write. So a moment as an actor that then shaped you to become a playwright. I mean, in my case, there's sort of a um, bridge period, I guess you could say, because I had studied uh, very diligently, uh, you know, whatever, my undergrad was a, a sort of high pressure program or something. Uh, acting program, so people got cut, you know? I mean, we thought it was the end of the world uh, if that <laughs> happened. Um, uh, but I thought I wanted to be sort of a classical regional theater actor. So I wanted to play like Major Barbara and things like that. And then we started doing improv, like I guess my senior year, and I I just took to it, right? And, and um, 
eventually I got into sort of the improv and the kind of high pressure comedy scene in LA. And I, and I was in something called the Sunday company at the groundlings where it was just, you know, it's funny when I think about that now, because in the States, the Liz Lerman method of feedback and all of that, that we do here, that's really quite kind and very artist focused. That process was much more, at least then, it was much more like, you know, you'd present a scene and the person running the Sunday company would be like, get off the stage and don't ever let me see that again, you know? Um, so it was very, uh, you know, or you'd get it in the show and it would bomb. So I learned how to do that. And, and that was really that middle period. What I realized was, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to be the one doing this anymore. Um, I just, I want to hand it off to other people. And then I had written this two-hander with another woman. And when a friend of mine said, can I take that to a director's lab and work on it? And I said, you mean like a real play? Like not us in it. He's like, yeah. I said, oh, that'd be great. And I think that's when I just literally went, oh, I'm so happy to hand this off to somebody. But, um, but it's always, in, it informs all of my writing, I think. You just kind of can't, kind of can't shake it for better or worse, right? The being, a, the being an actor and, and uh, the way that, I've also just feel lucky being able to observe really great directors among them, Evren Ochikin from Golden Thread, now at OSF, um, Mark Wing Davey, Mimi O'Donnell, like watching people who are at a very high level speak to actors into the heart of the moment. I'm like, oh, that's A, why I wasn't a very good actor and B, this is really good for me to understand now as I'm writing because that director picked up on the turn that this character's made that I didn't even realize I had written in there. Um, and they're solidifying what this blueprint that I've put down. So I don't know if that answers that question, but it wasn't a character, I guess I should say that. It wasn't like I saw a character and went, oh my God, this means I wanna write. I think I just wanted to be listened to, you know? I was like, listen to me, you know, some child impulse that probably should have gotten worked out, but it didn't. So, you know, here we all are. But Hannah, I, you said something earlier today, I feel like you must say in this context about your characters. It was so That's brilliant, not, it was so great. That's so not fair. Um, I, I, will, you you say it. No, I will. I will, I, I will say it. But what I will say first, before I say that, is that on the question of a character, um, really important moment for me was I think it was around 2000, 2001. I went to see a play called Nine Parts of Desire, written by Heather Raffo, performed by Heather Raffo, and she came to London and did it at the Bush. I had never seen an Arab actress on stage who was so brilliant and who did all these different characters and all these women I knew and I'd never seen it done before and I went oh my gosh it's allowed it like I'm so grateful to Heather um yeah that was a really key moment for me so what I said earlier was we were talking about characters and I said basically I can't sort of tell you in advance who my characters are going to be because basically they're all me or my dad or my mum or my granny <laughs> Which is true, because what I do is I sort of I do the research, I work really hard, I do the research, I know the situation that I'm setting up, but then I sort of try and put myself in the shoes of the characters and imagine what I would do if I was them. So it's not as lazy as it sounds. I then realised after I said this, and Hassan and Mona were laughing at me, I was like, no, that sounds terrible, doesn't it? Or really narcissistic, but um, hopefully not that, hopefully just empathetic. Yes, I think we all get inspiration from our, our family um, and not from our political leaders. So I want to, in our final few minutes, I want to throw in the election and Brexit and I don't know what's happening. <laughs> how, are folks, uh, how are folks coping um, with, with this situation? Has everyone voted already? Or uh, Mona and Tarek? Um, early voting doesn't start until tomorrow in New York, but I have my plan. Uh, so on Tuesday, I'll be, I'll be heading out to vote. 
Yeah, I, I mean, mean, it earlier, seems appropriate mm -hmm, for this ahead. conversation. It seems appropriate to say that all the ways of, of this anxiety in this country about ballots and and corruption. I mean, I think if I'm looking around this circle itself, right, where most of our families come from or we ourselves come from, are often the places that the Western world likes to look at to say, oh, well, that's just, look at that, look at that corruption. And people are very scared, as you know, Tuash, you know, and I think there's a great deal of anxiety. I, I've definitely got a circle of friends who were like, I can't do, don't ask me anything till after. Yeah, I remember when um, Trump was elected in, in um, I don't know, when he was elected, there was like a little gathering of theater artistic directors in the Bay Area to figure out, oh my God, what happened? What should our response be? And I was like, you know, to actually be aligned with your political leader is so rare and such a privilege. Uh, you know, most leaders are corrupt and not popularly elected and not, you know, all the things that we take for granted um, with our with our democracy. And so, as you know, I said I come from Iran, a country where you know many in the country do not identify with their leadership. So not identifying with our political leadership is a, is a part of part of our daily life. Part of the problem too of the last four years is just the idea of not knowing where anything is going or, or not knowing what's going to happen in any given circumstance. Like I think about um, dur when during Trump's actual inauguration, I was actually in Algeria. Um, I, I brought uh, my wife had come uh, for the first time to go see Algeria. And um, we came back the week before that, that Muslim ban had been put into effect. And so um, I remember flying home thinking like, they're saying this is gonna happen. I don't know what's gonna happen when I land, you know, I have a US passport, but I also have an Algerian passport. So I don't know. And so I think that's kind of a microcosm of what the problem has been the last four years is that we nothing is really known about what's going to happen or how things are going to happen. And I think that's really what the anxiety is. Um, but the thing I do keep in mind to keep myself positive and uplifting is that as, as much as as bad as this was in 2016, a positive note is how few people did vote in 2016 because you don't really need to overturn any Trump votes to vote him out. You just need people to finally feel empowered enough to leave their home to go cast a, a vote. And as long as that happens, I think we might be okay, but you know that's always still a big if. But I don't think we need to have some of the most uh, diehard of his of his Kool Aid drinkers see the light in order to rectify what's the situation there. So I, I try to keep that as a positive in the back of my mind. I don't know if that actually translates as well. We we appreciate that, Tarek. Hannah and Hassan, are you feeling the the impact of Brexit at all? The, the changes that are happening? Brexit, in a way, somewhat disappeared from the headlines. And I mean, we were, we were like Brexit every day. It was uh, up to COVID. And that is really worrying because we don't really, it's, it's what, what is being done in the background uh, on Brexit is, is really worrying. Like what, what, what the effects of what will come out uh, will probably not be as thoroughly debated as if we if we didn't have the COVID uh, uh, because it, it really has receded from the from from the headlines. Uh, so uh, we are looking. It looks like we are heading towards a no deal uh, Brexit. That's that's definitely happening, and that's that was before a nightmare scenario that even the even the conservatives. Even the even the group who are pro Brexit were were often going no 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 this is not going to happen we will find it 
So we are now like, they're like, oh yes, yeah, it's gonna happen, you know, we're gonna have a no deal Brexit. And it's like, wow, that was the thing, that was the precipice we were all fearing, but COVID has somehow made it less. So it seems um, it's, it's, people are so worried about that, that they are, that, that they don't see that this is going to be a real cliff we're jumping off. Uh, so it, it has made matters, matters worse in that, in that regard. From my point of view, I think the biggest, the biggest sort of legacy of Brexit has been, and also the government that we have and the way they've behaved is that it feels like, and I think you probably echo this in the States, is, is that there seems to be permission for people to be racist. So people who probably were always racist, but, but kept it to themselves, now it's okay. And, you know, the incidents of, of, you know, racial abuse that people are suffering is disgusting. And I think um, that the, the legacy of Brexit, we don't quite know yet, Hassan, what it's going to be for us every day, because of course the deals haven't been reached, but I mean, even on a personal level. So I can't talk about this very much yet, but I have been offered a post uh, uh, in the States and it took a really long time for that to be agreed. And I didn't know why that was. And now I know it's because that UK won't be in, in the EU when, when this, you know, when this thing happens. So, so it makes it really complicated. And I, you know, I could have not got the job as a result of that if it, you know, so I think it will have really big repercussions on people's lives and we don't even know what they are yet, like day to day, um, which is worrying. But yeah, but the, the whole permiss permissive racism thing is just distressing and awful. Yeah, in the Bay Area, we've seen a surprisingly high number of anti-Armenian violence, uh, violent acts. The school and church were, there was graffiti written on the walls and then uh, the church, the school hall was uh, burned. They, they said it was arson. So uh, that's really, shocking to me in this day and age in, in the Bay Area too. So um, yeah, it's not just anti-Muslim. I think you're right that everyone uh, feels like they have a carte blanche to express whatever hatred they have towards anybody in ways that were completely unacceptable before. Um, we are almost at our at time. Um, any last comments or Words of wisdom you want to share? I mean, I'm really grateful to you, Taraj, as well. Oh, I just want to say that you and, and Golden Thread, and um, you, you're, you've kind of held a lot of us together and held us up. And um, I'm excited for this next part of your life. Yes, yes. Maybe one day I'll be, I'll be a full-time playwright. Uh, Tarek, yeah. This this commission has been a bit of a, a lifesaver. Um, right when New York uh, fully, like, really locked down and became the epicenter of the virus in the world, I my my second child was born, and so we had a, a baby through the height of the of the pandemic, and so dealing with that, and then after he was born, and just dealing with having a, a second kid in the middle of all this, I was feeling very, um, very uncreative, you know? Um, it was very hard. And then I felt awful about myself as like, what kind of writer are you that you can't write right now? Uh, which now that I'm past it a little bit, I realize is ridiculous. Um, but then when I got your email about this, like, hey, what do you think of this idea? It really kind of helped me out of that, that hole, that, that like creative block of a, of a kind of hole I dug myself into. So I was very, very appreciative of, of, uh, of your commission and, and just go over it in general. Well, thank you. Thank you to you for your writing and for your talent and for your creativity and for sharing it with us. Uh, I wanna thank HowlRound for providing this free live stream service. Uh, I want to uh, thank Wendy Reyes, our live stream tech, and uh, Linda Giron, who's minding the Facebook live stream and sending me questions. 
join us uh, next time for our third no summary conversation with the team of Golden Thread Fairy Tale players. That will be on November 6th, and that will focus on theater for young audiences and how representation matters even more for children. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, check out our programming on goldenthread.org and join our email list if you are not on it yet. Thank you so much.